month uh, the other researchers and uh, we are able to permit them on campus so that they can measure the, their ranking so i welcome all the participants in this measurement session thank you okay thank you sir okay now i request uh, mr marvin with your presentation now close it is yours okay thank you thank you thank you sir um, so it's very nice uh, for me to be uh, also part of this uh, fraternity um, i understand the situation is not so uh, empowering right now uh, also in india uh, things are maybe slowly coming uh, back in control um, i am from mumbai and uh, the situation here is also not so great as of now um, but yeah, instead, in spite of all of this, also I see that uh, so many people joining, so many people uh, from the technical fraternity also uh, sharing their thoughts so freely, so uh, so nicely. As sir also said, um, uh, the setups are available already uh, in the institution, and uh, this also can be utilized. Um, it's it's a nice, um, uh, such a nice uh, you know uh, gesture. Uh, I'm happy and honored to be part of this. Uh, today, what I will do is uh, I will share some of our uh, experiences uh, from Rode and Schwartz, um in uh, the antenna measurements uh, aspect uh, using the network analyzers. Yeah, um, sir, am I audible? Uh, is it uh, visible here? Yeah, you are yes, audible. Sir. You are audible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. OK, so going further, this is uh, the agenda that I propose. Uh, we will initially be starting with uh, a short introduction, some uh, architecture uh, basics, because the network analyzer, as I said, is uh, very important to understand uh, how we really use it. It's uh, um, uh, worlds apart from uh, getting uh, the simulation work done using the software. Uh, this is uh, to give us practical results, what's available uh, once the antenna has been fabricated. Uh, it's important then for us to have some do's and don'ts. Um, it's much better for us to understand this once we go through the architecture. Um, the important part is that, okay, the fabricated antenna, of course, will not be behaving as good as the simulation. Uh, so there will be a requirement of some antenna tuning. Uh, impedance measurement and antenna tuning will be the next topic. Uh, what's uh, really a hot topic here now is um, using metamaterials, uh, beam forming and antenna testing. This is what we will also look at. Uh, also, uh, phased array antennas, uh, multiport antennas, how this is done. And uh, to uh, conclude with this, also some important topics on the uh, over the air uh, antenna measurement uh, testing. Uh, this is um, also uh, some details on the topics of near field and far field uh, antenna testing is what I will also um, uh, touch base on. Uh, of course, those, these are all by itself uh, quite deep uh, topics um, uh, and uh, questions will obviously be there. Uh, maybe we can also um, discuss this uh, offline as well. Uh, we are always available for um, such kind of uh, interactions. So I'll just start with uh, an introduction. Uh, so what is Rode and Schwartz basically doing with antennas? Uh, so the antenna solutions available from Rode and Schwartz uh, really range um, quite deep. Uh, we are hands deep into the um, antenna systems, especially when it comes to direction finders. Uh, Rode and Schwartz builds its own direction finder. Um, so Rode and Schwartz is specially uh, involved in uh, uh, providing and producing and um, uh, giving this also to the military. This is very widely used, uh, not only in Germany, also in India. Uh, as you can see, this is what we call as a man pack. Um, so uh, this is more of a mobile direction finding system. Uh, you will be able to find the direction of arrival of um, such kind of uh, RF signals, uh, which is the direction of this. This is important uh, and there are some special antenna hardware which requires to be developed in this case a lot of patch antennas a lot of metamaterials also uh, being discussed um, in uh, future applications of uh, the direction finding substructures 
Um, of course, uh, also Roland Schwartz uh, builds uh, not only the man pack, but also a very large direction finding systems, ones which are mounted on vehicles, uh, on uh, airplanes and so on. Uh, this is also available and uh, deputed, deployed in the uh, military. Uh, another aspect of this is to now test these antennas. So, of course, Roden Schwartz uh, also provides um, or has its own test systems. Uh, we also have our test chamber in Germany um, and certain other places also world over uh, where we provide uh, the heart of uh, the entire test system is basically the test instrument here is the network analyzer. So the vector network analyzer provided by Roden Schwartz, as you can see here also in the pic, um, is a really uh, much more evolved version of the Roden Schwartz uh, network analyzer series, uh, which is starting from so many years before. Um, this is one of the latest offerings that we have, and uh, is also Roden Schwartz is also proud to have um, an array of uh, test equipments, the vector network analyzers. Uh, Roden Schwartz also believes mainly in uh, solutions. Um, so we have to provide not only the test uh, equipment, but also a solution, something to build around it. Um, so because this is also required, the chambers are required, the transmit antennas are required, the receive antenna positioners are required and so on. Um, this is also a turnkey solution available from, as a turnkey solution available from Roden Schwartz. Um, so antenna chambers and so on, um, uh, OTA test systems, what we call as over the air test systems, uh, are also uh, provided as a turnkey solution from Roden Schwartz, a full fledged, a holistic solution from Roden Schwartz. So, this is as an introduction to Roden Schwartz uh, itself, how we have some experiences on that basis we can now share with you. Um, we also have uh, some experiences with um, starting from 2G, 3G, 4G, and what's required in 5G? Antennas. A massive load of antennas, a massive uh, MIMO scenario for antennas. And this is uh, what also Roden Schwartz uh, is providing solutions for. You can see this uh, on the right hand side is also one of the uh, 5G uh, test solutions that we provide. So test and measurement RNS vector network analyzers. Um, so getting into a little bit of detail on the network analyzer here. Um, to start with, we need to get a little bit of brush up on the network analyzer on the uh, antenna measurement parameters. So what are these parameters which are important uh, from the antenna point of view? Uh, the antenna being the device which we have to test. Um, of course, uh, there is uh, impedance matching that we have to uh, first make sure a matching network is required you can see these are more circuit based parameters uh, we understand that there is a feed line uh, and then you have the load that's the uh, maybe the free space for example uh, this matching network uh, between the antenna and the feed line um, the coaxial cable which is going on to the source uh, these things uh, have to be really well matched uh, typically, this would be for 50 ohm system. It could be, for example, nowadays also for differential systems uh, where it could be uh, uh, 100 ohms and so on. So, different antenna uh, feed mechanisms and different antenna matching networks uh, need to be uh, discussed and focused upon, need to be measured as one of the most important parameters would be for matching. What does this matching deliver? Having a good matching basically gives you a better VSWR and uh, return loss. This is one of the important characteristic parameters of any network analyzer. Um, so what is this? Uh, we are able to get uh, a better um, a VSWR if we have a good return loss, if we have a good matching. Certain other related parameters are also reflection, um, uh, are also uh, reflection coefficients, uh, bandwidths, and uh, S parameters. Um, these also uh, give us uh, the VSWR and return loss in a different format. The antenna itself, now coming to the antenna itself, if you see um, uh, from simulations, we understand the current distribution. Um, we also require in practice to understand what is the antenna or the array factor. Uh, the antenna factor, uh, for example, is 
very much important because we do not really understand maybe how much would be the attenuation uh, from the source until the uh, aperture of the antenna. This has also has to be studied. This is something also which we provide solutions for to measure and document uh, the parameters like antenna factors. Uh, radiation efficiency is also very important to understand uh, how good uh, the gain of the antenna uh, is available, how good the directivity basically has been converted into the gain uh, for the antenna itself. So the radiation efficiency also uh, is uh, one of the important parts which are measured uh, in the antenna. Now coming to the field aspect, so we also need to understand now finally when we have the antenna radiating into the uh, air, how is the radiation pattern? How is the radiation pattern? Is it um, uh, isotropic? Is it a pencil beam uh, having a high enough directivity? What is the beam width? What is the polarization? What is the effective aperture? These are certain um, special parameters that we will be able to derive from the radiation pattern. So just broadly putting it forward, these are the measurement parameters that are of essence when we come to antenna uh, as a device. Very important uh, is for an RF engineer uh, to understand uh, these impedances, uh, the matching, um, and uh, for that reason, to best solve such matching issues that we have, we have this Smith chart. Any impedance or reactive resistor or reactive can be plotted on a Smith chart. This is a very special tool, a very special tool designed and developed, um, especially uh, by Mr. Uh, Philip Smith, and then hence the name the Smith chart. Um, used extensively in impedance matching, uh, available on display formats on network analyzers. So network analyzers, obviously, if they are um, used for uh, impedance matching, if they are used for this, they obviously should be providing us this detail on the Smith chart. What is the impedance of the antenna feed? This is much better like, delivered to us on a, uh, on a Smith chart. But why? Uh, why is it required and why we see that the Smith chart can give us this data uh, much better or represent this data better or is it better for us for calculations? Yes. Uh, if we see this, uh, a perfect match, a well-matched uh, device, a well-matched antenna will provide us the trace right at the center. As you can see here, a perfect match. If this, uh, at certain frequencies, uh, the antenna is also a short, it is rejecting the uh, signals, it should be uh, well on this side of the Smith chart, on this plot, on this point of the Smith chart. And then we can say that, okay, it's a perfect shot. It is um, reflecting back the signals. And also here you can see this would be a proper point for representation on the Smith chart for a perfect open. Um, this is, of course, very ideal, but definitely we do have some uh, additional uh, effects of the antenna, um, and uh, this is of the antenna being resistive, um, capacitive, and uh, also being inductive. These are also very clearly put up on the Smith chart. It's much easier for us to then see from this display uh, of the chart on the Smith chart, the trace on the Smith chart, uh, the measurement readings on the Smith chart, much easier for us to understand, yeah, is this antenna not a perfect match because it's more capacitively loaded? Then, okay, yes, then let's provide some more inductive loading and make a better match out of it. These are much uh, better and easier done on a Smith chart. Uh, as you can see here, the Smith chart itself uh, is also available on one of the very old network analyzers very old as you can see here uh, roughly around 1958 these are one of the first in the 1950s the first network analyzers uh, provided by Roda and Schwartz uh, as you can see here this is um, not even called as a network analyzer way back then uh, by Roda and Schwartz you can see the small Roda and Schwartz logo right here and um, this is uh, at that time called as a ZG digraph um, a very different name way back then but the purpose was the same, uh, to provide for a signal between uh, 300 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, as you can see, the connectors available here and to test the reflections and the transmissions, uh, especially on the Smith chart. 
So I don't think there was really a display available way back then. Also, there was uh, mostly a plotter kind of a system really available to provide this uh, uh, display or measurement uh, or the trace on a smith chart. But that's how important smith charts were uh, since way back then. It's uh, very clear to uh, uh, see this. Uh, am I audible, uh, sir? I'm getting some messages that it is dropping. Yes. Yes, it's perfectly okay. audible. They're having a yes, problem. Okay, okay, okay. Then I'll carry on uh, with the presentation. Yeah, sure. So, uh, if we require to do this kind of a test uh, of impedance measurements, uh, what do we need to do? The network analyzer uh, is helping you test such antennas. So, this is the internal architecture of a network analyzer. The antenna itself of course, not be providing an RF signal of its own. So the RF source is necessary to be there inside the VNA. As you can see here, one of the first parts on the network analyzer architecture is a source. The source is then switched either to port one or to port two. The RF then from this is switched either to excite port one or to port two. In a two port antenna system, uh, MIMO, for example, we then require these two ports uh, to check the coupling between these two ports as well. Uh, the output can be taken in from port one and measurement be done on port two to check the mutual coupling between two MIMO antennas. Uh, if it is for the same antenna, then what we will uh, require as a single port antenna, then what we will require is to measure the reflection. The reflection parameter will basically give us the complete understanding and characterize the antenna. What do we require now to understand the reflection? Yes, we do have a source. This is used then to excite the antenna, which will be connected to test port one. The signal will of course be absorbed uh, in the antenna uh, design uh, region, uh, that frequency which it is designed for. Um, of course, this will be there, but what about those frequencies which will it will reflect back the signal? So for those frequencies where it will be reflecting back the signal, we will require to have a receiver to measure this. This is what we call as the measurement receiver. As you can see here, we have this measurement receiver which will take the signal. Uh, a small uh, coupled output of the reflected signal is then provided to the measurement receiver. But we also have a coupled uh, power from the incident signal also being provided to a reference receiver. So both the incident signal, what is available from the internal source, and the signal available from the reflected power of the, of the antenna are both measured. So here you can check this is what we will call as A1, as the incident wave, and B uh, as the measured or the reflected wave. Uh, this is for port 1, so we call this as A1 and B1. Now a ratio of this is what will give us the return loss of antenna which is being connected at test port one. So what we would uh, professionally call this by as S11. So S11 is nothing else but the ratio of B1 by A1. This is what we will um, be very clearly uh, seeing uh, by this architecture of the network analyzer. A similar one would be required also at test port two, and that's why we have a small coupling element here or a VS bridge um, to also take the output power of the incident wave uh, into a reference receiver at port two, what we call as A2. And the reflected signal, um, maybe for example, if you're having a MIMO antenna being connected, test port one, test port two being connected here, what is the mutual coupling between the antenna? What is being transmitted is first documented or also taken as a reference by A1. And now what is being received here is going on to the measurement receiver, what we call as B2. And the ratio of this again will give us S21, that is the B2 by A1. So this is a typical internal architecture of a network analyzer. It's plain simple like this, but you can see the, uh, the reason why the network analyzers are some things which are uh, um, uh, something not so economical. It is something which will be requiring some uh, conditioning. Also, as you can see here, the network analyzer definitely 
um, will have not only a signal source for the required frequency range, maybe it's in the gigahertz range, maybe even in the terahertz range. This is available from the network analyzers nowadays. Um, this source is definitely something that is required. Um, we have uh, uh, this in, embedded in the network analyzer internal architecture, but also it has receivers inside in the box. Not only one, but as you can see for a two port VNA, there are four receivers. So this is what is uh, the design complexity inside the network analyzer itself. The network analyzer itself also not only has just a signal source, but also not one, but four receivers, or you can say in a certain way, these are spectrum analyzers. So these are internally, let's say four spectrum analyzers or four receivers uh, to be more accurate, uh, which is there inside the network analyzer. VNA result format. So now finally, once we have uh, this architecture implemented, once we have the hardware available with us, now to display the parameters of the antenna. Yes, so to display the parameters of the antenna, uh, the first important part that we saw in the initial slides, the return loss. The return loss is one of the reflection measurements as you can see on the uh, top left of the screen that yes, return loss is available versus frequency. The axis here, X axis is frequency and the Y axis is amplitude. So you'll be able to measure then uh, get a clear indication of the return loss of the antenna, which is being measured. Not only this, but you can also see the same results being uh, implemented in a different format, what we will call as the VSWR or the voltage standing wave ratio uh, for the antenna that is also visible here a measured value. You can see here, okay, at certain frequencies, it's quite good. At certain frequencies, it's not. Uh, also from the return loss, maybe in simulations might show you, okay, yes, we can get 20 dB or something like this. Uh, but maybe in practice, um, it's the fabrication issues, uh, which have been limiting it to maybe just 10 dB. Um, and then further optimization required uh, on the uh, fabricated antenna, some more tuning, which would be required here. Uh, input phase and most importantly, you can see the input impedance displayed on the switch chart. So this is a screenshot of the network analyzer itself when it comes to reflection measurements. Uh, the same thing can also be seen as a transmission measurements. As I said, there's S11, but there's also S21, the transmission measurements. So you can also see maybe um, uh, uh, filters uh, being measured here, the gain, the loss, the group delay. Uh, these things can also be measured for uh, the antenna. Metamaterial antennas um, uh, or any antenna for that matter uh, definitely has to go through some tuning. Um, so antenna tuning, impedance measurements of the antenna feed is essential. The feed, especially if we are seeing that, okay, it's surrounded by a uh, certain kind of such SRRs. We need to make sure that, okay, in spite of this, we are able to, or how much of an improvement has this got in terms of the tuning. Uh, this is uh, the, the measurement factor that we have to really see is the impedance. So the impedance uh, matching is really critical uh, for tuning the antenna. And how do we really see this impedance? Uh, as we had shown you earlier, yes, we can see this on the Smith chart. Um, as you can see here on the background, there is really a Smith chart. But also it's possible here on the network analyzer to do further tuning, not measuring what is the impedance, but also finding out that how do we tune it? What are the different methods how we can tune this? Uh, we can of course go in for stub matching. We can go in for adding certain lumped elements, SMDs. Uh, we can surface mount devices. We can also uh, get these from the market uh, certain capacitances, certain inductances. Uh, we know for sure that not all the required lump impedances would be really available, but yeah, maybe we can see what um, a trial and error method really works out. Uh, we'll have to solder it on the antenna. Uh, this is not giving us the required matching, desolder it and so on. But this could be a very lengthy process. And that's why on the network analyzer, now you have directly what we call as a embedding function. We can see here that we can not only uh, check the impedance of the antenna, but also on the smith chart, but also you can um, put these antennas or subject these antennas 
to specific uh, lumped impedances virtually. So Rodenschwartz network analyzers provide built antenna tuning and impedance matching using virtual transforms. Virtual transforms are nothing else but now these certain capacitances, for example, in series or inductances in parallel or certain other circuits, a library of circuits which are available here um, for uh, certain uh, L and C combinations, the actual values of the L and C itself also can be edited. Resistances in the circuit also can be edited. And this can be used to initially virtually check what is the um, required SMD component and then simply go to the market and get the required SMD component once and for all. A single solder should be sufficient in this case for you. Instead of doing a trial and error method uh, using hardware, uh, this virtual method really helps quite a bit to improve the matching of the antenna under test, especially patch antennas. Also a different um, approach available on the network analyzer is the time domain technique. By really subjecting the feed of the antenna uh, to uh, RF energy and then measuring this versus time, uh, sending the a certain chirp signal into the um, antenna feed and then measuring the reflected signal we are also able to do some time domain analysis. And using the time domain or time is basically, we can convert it uh, into distance. We are able to then understand what is the impedance of this um, antenna as we go and enter deeper and deeper into the feed line. Uh, you can see here as an example, Initially, the feed line is 50 ohms, so it's much clearer also from the red trace here that yes, it is a 50 ohm signal that is reflected back, the impedance then. So the S11 itself is calculated and then converted into a Z parameter, that's the red trace. So it's 50 ohms initially, yes, it was designed for 50 ohms. And then when we go further, maybe be required to do some matching also for 75 ohms, as you can see here now there has been some reflections because of the abrupt uh, discontinuity. Uh, and this also, when we see the marker two, it does give us about 75.38 ohms. Yes, so this is quite good. It is really in practice also roughly around 75 ohms. And then going back to 50 ohms, we can see, yes, again, there is a reflection uh, because of the abrupt discontinuity and then 50 ohms, but then again, uh, we have changed the strip line to a 25 ohms. Uh, things like this are much clearer than using this time domain approach to see how we, when we go uh, penetrate into the feed line, uh, how the impedance really is changing. Uh, maybe we do not want to have such kind of reflections. Uh, okay, then we need to shape these contours, uh, make it uh, a little less abrupt, and maybe see how these sudden reflections or losses of energy uh, reduction of the efficiency of transmission can be really uh, optimized. And then finally, you can see the antenna. In this case, we are just mentioning here as a 50 ohm system and so on. So two different techniques that we saw for the impedance tuning uh, for the antenna that you would actually want to measure. One is the Smith chart and uh, internal virtual transform uh, functions that we have um, specially designed to uh, help you with the uh, uh, tuning of the antenna, matching uh, using certain lumped elements. From this, you can derive what value of L, whether it, it is required in series and parallel, what value of C in series or in parallel are required to optimize your circuit, your antenna matching. The second one that we saw this is also to see the same um, antenna feed line uh, into the time domain function. So using the time domain function, we can also check deeper that okay, when we penetrate into the feed line, is the antenna feed really giving us the required um, expected results or not? So where exactly are the inefficiencies coming from? This is also clear from this. For metamaterials, what is really unique? What is required more uh, as a novel approach? What is required more as a novel measurement technique uh, in uh, network analyzers. 
digging deeper now we understand also uh, from our experiences for certain customers of ours who also are building holographic beam formers um, this is very much required as you can see here for a 5g typing system uh, yes uh, these are based on certain concepts of meta materials um, uh, certain analog beam forming uh, approaches uh, can be really uh, optimized using uh, meta materials um, so in this case also certain additional dc bias also is required um, for exciting the varactor diodes which will in turn provide certain different levels of capacitive loadings uh, to maybe have phase differences and then modulate the phase and the amplitude of the elements for a better uh, beam forming a better beam steering uh, in this case for better radiation uh, if this uh, is possible, um, this would be really good. This is something which uh, many of our customers are also working on. Uh, what uh, can we provide to them? How can Rodin Short help in this case? Um, we also provide additionally in the same architecture. I'm going back um, in this slide uh, to the architecture that we proposed. We have the internal source. We have the internal measurement and reference receivers, multiple of them. What more can we do to help you um, come across or overcome the uh, beams forming issues that are there here using the varactor diode? Uh, of course, what is possible here then is to add certain bias T's. As you can see here, we have now added in this uh, additional bias T. Yeah, so here by adding the bias T, we can also um, include or superimpose both the RF signal and also an additional DC bias uh, to the antenna, which is connected at test port one. The antenna then gets the feed from the um, uh, from the VNA itself. It gets both the RF, but also the DC uh, through the same line. These coaxial lines are built to also support both DC and RF. This is what is required also for such kind of uh, base station antennas, um, uh, tower mounted antennas, we would not see a separate DC line also going through. Um, the same RF feed line is also carrying the DC component. Uh, this is uh, making it mandatory for network analyzers also to have an internal bias T. Uh, so this is what is additionally now added in the network analyzer architecture. Um, the additional bias T is, as you can see, highlighted here in this diagram. Also, going further for not just a single port antenna, but when we are looking here at 5G and um, different other applications, multi port antennas are to picture. How do we really test these multi port antennas? Uh, the, mo the major problem that we have here is uh, antenna mutual coupling, right? So, multi port antenna uh, elements suffer. Uh, mutual coupling effects. Now, what is exactly this this mutual coupling? So, as you can see here, maybe we do have uh, an antenna uh, which is radiating here. In practice, this is put maybe on a phased array. The signal that is affecting uh, the VSWR or the return loss of this antenna is not only the antenna itself, the design of this element itself, but also the radiation being coupled into this particular antenna. So you can see here that, okay, the antenna in the right at the center is also affected, not because of reflections by its own self, which we will actually put it out as a return loss, but also because of um, uh, additional uh, uh, radiations from the neighboring antennas. And this is what we will call as a mutual coupling effect. Um, this is uh, always occurring in practice. Okay, if we are just testing it in the lab, we are probably testing one antenna element at a time. But in practice, it's not the case. In practice, we will be generating signals uh, from each and every one of these elements, all of them simultaneously transmitting a signal. So it's required also to have uh, the network analyzer able to do this uh, to, uh, to basically measure uh, how good or how bad is the mutual coupling. Of course, mutual coupling can be further improved by isolation techniques, by um, uh, a DGP technique, uh, by uh, using metamaterials in between them. 
but how can this be asserted? We see many such applications also here. Um, for example, the base station linear array, uh, two adjacent antennas, uh, as you can see here, are also available in the base station panel antenna uh, that is there. So we have to also check for the mutual coupling effects uh, of two adjacent antennas. Um, also going further uh, for uh, 5G antenna arrays, um, really massive MIMO situations and so on. We also see, okay, multiple adjacent antennas, uh, maybe eight, maybe 17, maybe multiple more. Uh, this uh, problem just keeps on getting more and more critical. Uh, what is the effect if we do not measure this, if we do not pay attention towards this? At the end, it's reduced capacity. So if you're having a reduced capacity, uh, uh, maybe very bad reflections in the antenna itself, uh, the mutual coupling effect, the energy radiated from the adjacent antennas gets absorbed back into the antenna array instead of being transmitted. So, of course, if this was your expected beam uh, to um, really uh, take care or uh, uh, meet the requirements of all of these different uh, UEs, users in the base station region, coverage region, now you're not able to meet them. So now your coverage itself has reduced and you are going to have uh, coverage issues also on the UE side. And that's the reason why mutual coupling effects are very important to understand and measure them. Is this really possible now uh, to measure it? Yes. In the network analyzer, as we had seen earlier, we do have this source. Initially, we say that, okay, only source one requires, uh, port one requires to be excited, or maybe port two requires to be excited for an S11 test, or for an S22 test, or for an S21 test. Uh, in either case, only one of the source need to be act activated at a time. But yes, in this, we require both the antennas to be activated at the same time. Uh, both antenna one and antenna two need to be activated. So we have this internal switch, which can be used in this way. We can also make sure that also multiple antennas can be tested um, uh, simultaneously. The word simultaneously is very important here. Uh, at, um, uh, let's say, subsequently one after the other, if you are doing this, uh, of course, this does not resolve the mutual coupling effect. So. Uh, give us an uh, understanding of the mutual coupling. It's important for us to see this variation being occurring simultaneously. So yes, we do have network analyzers, as you can see here, um, uh, the ones which are basically doing what we call as uh, passive return loss, single element return loss measurements, but also those which are doing active return loss, simultaneous measurements. So basically, as you can see, there is a screenshot given here on the right hand side of both the passive return loss and also of an active return loss. So you can see that, okay, the passive return loss is really showing us a very beautiful picture, but the active return loss now showing us that, okay, yes, it has been distorted uh, at certain frequencies, maybe going better. At certain frequencies, maybe this is the required frequency where um, the mutual coupling effects now are much better uh, because of maybe a good isolation um, in between the antennas or some effects being uh, observed there. This can then be used to further optimize our requirement to meet our cause, uh, to check which is the frequency that really we require this mutual coupling effects to be uh, much lower and so on. So this is something that we can also do with uh, the network analyzers available from Rodin Shorts, not only for two antennas, uh, but now we have this also for multiple more. So maybe it's four, maybe it's eight, maybe it's 16, 24 antennas, for example, and so on. Uh, so this is what is required for a phased array uh, with four antennas also, all of them to be simultaneously excited. So this is something which is very important. We now are coming across to a different uh, requirement till now. It was usually only to measure passive return loss but now we see that, okay, with phased array antennas, it's very important to also measure the term called active return loss or active reflection coefficient, where simultaneous measurements or simultaneous signal excitations would be required. Um, looking at uh, the current scenarios, uh, we are also very much engaging um, our defense requirements. Uh, Roran Schwartz also very actively looks at this. 
this is a screenshot or a picture of uh, one of the more um, widely being talked about uh, aircrafts, the Rafale. So you can see the Rafale C-137 here. Uh, this, um, if you really get a chance to open it up, uh, the nose of the uh, uh, of the aircraft, you can see that it is uh, having also internally uh, a phased array antenna. This is basically a radar, uh, what is also called as, a, as an AESA radar, uh, electronically steerable uh, antenna structure that is there here. So uh, this uh, definitely does require this honeycomb structure that you can see uh, at the nose of the antenna basically is uh, a big uh, 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 plethora of uh, antennas, uh, a phased array antenna structure. Each one of them on the back end is then connected to a transmit reflect module and then to the radar processing system. Uh, this of course also uh, is a point of talk uh, so how do we really address such phased array applications? What is required here, especially in a phased array, is to also excite each of these elements with a marginally offsetted phase to steer the beam. So if we can do this, is it really possible? Can we have phase uh, deviation between each of these elements in a network analyzer? Can we provide, till now we see in the architecture that yes, there is uh, a single source available. How is it possible then to have both the antennas excited with a different phase? So this is also something which we need to cover in the next topic. Um, the network analyzer architecture needs to be further evolved. Uh, we also see that, okay, we stick on to the source one uh, that is typically there uh, with the first two slides where the architecture of the network analyzer connected to antenna one. The same thing then now can be copied and pasted something like this. Yeah, so you can also have a source two internally, which is exciting antenna two, source three and source four and so on. Each of these sources can be what we call as phase coherent. So the phase of each of these sources can be arbitrarily changed, we can check, okay, fine, if we are uh, having antenna one at a, uh, receiving an RF signal at phase angle zero, the second one getting an RF signal at the same frequency, but with a phase shift of 10 degrees. This can be geometrically maybe uh, progressed, and you can see here maybe at antenna three, um, a 20 degree uh, phase offset as compared to antenna one, Antenna four maybe at a 30 degree phase offset and so on. These, this uh, functionality now is available also in the latest network analyzers uh, to also have uh, additional phase coherence um, and uh, multiple sources internally to the network analyzer to excite each of these antennas uh, to measure phase coherence, to measure uh, beam steering to attempt beam steering on the multiport antenna, phase array antenna, which is connected as a device under test. So this is what I would like to cover in terms of antenna measurements by the network analyzer itself. Um, so we covered certain topics like um, the impedance measurements of the antenna in terms of uh, reflection, uh, in terms of return log, in terms of VSWR, yes, this is point number one. This is very essential. And this is something which is provided, yes, from the network analyzer. Um, but the network analyzer also additionally is giving us additional uh, uh, measurement parameters uh, and um, uh, further tuning functionalities uh, for the impedance. We can also have internally virtual transforms available uh, to also have multiple antennas being tested and tuning of these antennas being done um, to fabricate and find out what exactly would be the ideal SMD component to be purchased from the market in one shot and not really spoil uh, the fabricated antenna by multiple shouldering and multiple trials and errors. Um, furthermore, we also see that time domain approaches can be used to further penetrate into the antenna um, and see how the feed is really attempted uh, within the uh, antenna itself um, how the impedance really changes and how we can further optimize 
the efficiency of the transmission of the antenna by maybe further fine tuning um, at these impedance uh, abrupt mismatches. Um, also furthermore, we have seen how uh, the internal bias T can be useful uh, to uh, bias also these varactors, uh, to bias also maybe low noise amplifiers, especially this is noticed also in GPS antennas internally, um, there are certain low noise amplifiers, tower mounted amplifiers, which also uh, antennas, which require also such kind of RF internal biasing. Uh, this is also what we have seen here. Uh, finally, also we see how the phase array antennas also can be excited, uh, both uh, with a simultaneous feed, for uh, active return loss measurements and also with uh, phase shifts, uh, which can be used for uh, phased array antennas. On the final topic here, I'd also cover the over the air antenna testing. Over the air antenna testing uh, nowadays is really important. Why? Uh, why is over the air testing really coming into picture today a lot more than how it was there earlier? Um, what is different now? 5G. 5G NR uh, addresses, besides other applications, of course, uh, uh, it also addresses EMMBD, uh, so enhanced mobile broadband. So we are looking at data rates up to 20 Gbps. This is huge. Typically in 3G, maybe we are looking at uh, megabits per second, but here in 4G, maybe also in the range of um, uh, maybe much lesser than a gigabit. But here we're looking at uh, 20 gigabits per second is uh, required or expected in 5G. Um, this uh, really is uh, requesting from our side to go for bandwidth enhancements. So of course, um, the Shannon's law clearly uh, states that, okay, if we have uh, the requirement to go higher in terms of uh, uh, data rates, we require a larger bandwidth. This is available, maybe not in a contiguous manner in the lower frequencies, but yes, in the millimeter wave frequencies, we can also get this. Um, these high frequencies have higher path losses. So if you're going towards the millimeter wave frequencies, yes, we can solve the issue of um, bandwidth uh, crowding at the lower frequencies. At the higher frequencies, this is much better. But yeah, we have the problem of high path losses. Countermeasure. We have to overcome this by uh, providing beamforming techniques. These beamforming techniques um, need active antenna arrays, what we saw also earlier, AAS, uh, with multiple phase tiered antennas. For uh, beamforming, we do require an uh, array of antennas rather than just a single transmitting element. And this, furthermore, also uh, gets us to the uh, issue that okay phased arrays do not really allow a single cable connection right so having a phased array antenna typically uh, really pushes us to do measurements always over the air especially the fr2 uh, region in uh, frequency uh, band in the 5g uh, it really uh, mandates this in the conformance test requirements here as well it's very clear that there is all the tests uh, are to be done over the air, especially in FR2, which is between um, uh, 22 to, 20, uh, to 53 gigahertz in this frequency range. So when we are doing over the air measurements, the one of the more critical uh, uh, questions are that are we really doing the measurement correctly? Are we doing the measurement in the far field or not? Now, what is the reason for doing measurements in the far field and where exactly do we have the, have this far field? So the far field really is that region of space where we see that, okay, uh, the wavelet is well formed um, or uh, the aperture of the antenna that we are looking at is really able to see um, this wave uh, more as a plane wave, not uh, with a circular um, uh, fashion. But yes, if we want to see something like this, um, this we have to get it also in the far field where here we can see that, okay, the uh, E and H field are also quite orthogonal to each other. Uh, and here then it is sufficient uh, for us to measure by using the right hand rule uh, to measure and uh, uh, look at only the radial component. This is sufficient. So here this makes things more simpler for us by having the ENH field being more or less orthogonal 
this is much clear that in the far field now we do not require to do much detailed analysis having only the radial component being measured is sufficient for us but here now we also see that if we go closer to the uh, radiating element we also enter into the radiated near field or the reactive near field the reactive near field region is the place in space where adding a measurement element will actually detune the transmitting element the radiating element itself so if we are adding another antenna the receive antenna uh, within this reactive near field we are actually reacting with the radiation of the radiating element here so we are detuning somehow causing a uh, perturbation in the radiation of the uh, element uh, which you can see here is having the uh, length of d so we have to now move farther away from here we cannot do any measurements here it's very clear no uh, we cannot do measurements in the reactive near field this is just not uh, something that is expected we do not want to distort the field of the transmitting element itself so the only two regions that we have are the far field or the radiated near field region the radiated near field region yes here the issue is that the uh, e and h field are not perfectly orthogonal and for that reason we also uh, will not have uh, the pointing vector really uh, completely orthogonal to this we will then be having an issue uh, where we have to really measure both the magnitude and the phase yes but this is also something which can be done is possible a little bit more complicated but yes also we can do measurements in the radiated near field so far field much more simpler radiated near field also possible uh, some mathematical extrapolations are required measurements of both magnitude and phase both are required but reactive near field yes a definite no So measurements that can be performed in the radiated near field. So the spherical scan of the entire field in magnitude and phase needs to be done. So we really need to scan the entire uh, near field to get a better uh, extrapolation of what is the result. Um, the mathematical transformations into the far field are available. Certain algorithms are available, which will help us to do that. And uh, all the TX measurements are possible in this case is also specified by the standards how we can do these measurements um, directly in the uh, radiated near field or indirectly in the radiated near field um, either either of these methods can be used uh, for measuring these parameters so transforming from the near field to the far field this is done by a near field to far field extrapolation software um, so this is also available with us and we can basically take the data from the complex uh, near field uh, which is measured by the antennas provided by us uh, use the software which also have the, has this near field to far field extrapolation algorithm and then we get the radiated um, uh, the radiated radiation pattern of the antenna and the test even by having this um, also all of these measurements are definitely possible in a much better way of course uh, if we have the far field measurement done directly um, so the uh, measurements done in the far field are comparably much easier uh, every rf measurement can be performed um, including uh, eirp in beam measurements um, evms and so on all of these measurements of the device and the test can be done uh, even if they are uh, in this uh, far field far away from the antenna but the issue then starts here is one that we have a much higher path loss um, if you are going in for a direct near field uh, and the second thing is the space requirement it becomes a lot more larger uh, and it depends upon the size of the antenna and the test uh, so uh, this is very clear but yes uh, for example uh, at 30 gigahertz uh, for a specified uh, uh, antenna aperture size uh, uh, if you are having a 10 centimeter aperture size uh, then we are looking at the far field somewhere in the range of uh, two meters. So you're having two meters of uh, free space, uh, two meter large uh, or larger antenna chambers, uh, anechoic chambers, and maybe also to discuss on uh, the path loss uh, between these. Are we having the measurement equipment to cater to these path loss? However, in the direct field, uh, direct far field, also anechoic chambers are readily available, uh, but a lot more expensive, a lot more larger. 
but this also is one example of how these far field measurements can be done. Coming to the next part um, is also uh, for the over the air measurements, uh, not only is the chamber or how do we see the near field and far field, but also to understand the positioner. Uh, it's uh, now imperative that we also uh, check uh, uh, for how we can get the uh, 2D or 3D patterns of these uh, antennas, the radiated field of the antenna, the, radi the radiation pattern of this antenna. Uh, independent axis uh, for azimuth uh, is required and the elevation as well. Um, so the antenna here at the bottom uh, is the antenna under test. This uh, also rotates in this axis and the antenna up top here also rotates to give you both the elevation and the azimuth cut uh, for the antenna. Uh, these positioners uh, will then give you a full 360 uh, degree measurement and can typically uh, easily hold also very heavy devices. As you can see here, this is placed on a very stable stand in this case. The cable management also becomes much better. But one issue here is that, yes, we have also uh, additional uh, a shadow region, the back end. So this is something that we have to also take care of and understand, also, OK, there would be a shadow region in this case. Uh, you can also see maybe a live example of how these measurements are done. Uh, this is one of the antenna systems provided by Roden Schwartz. The vector network analyzer between um, majority of the measurements you can see here, uh, Roden Schwartz network analyzer. The software, as I said, is also available here. The software takes care of doing both the measurements automatically and also at the same time positioning the antenna for both the azimuth and elevation cuts. You can see here at different angles we can have this measurements being done. It's doing one measurement at a time for a different cut. The results are being documented from the network analyzer. As you can see, this is happening quite fast as well. The measurement readings are being documented. And what happens here in the chamber? In the chamber, you can also see the rotations are being taken care of all of this being done completely automatically. So you can see the transmit antenna here and the antenna and the test at the bottom, which is rotating to give you the results of the radiation pattern. At the end of it, then you have the chamber, have the transmit and receive antennas, and now you have the antenna and the test with the radiation pattern provided by the software. So this plethora of solutions are available. This is one example where we have a very small, what we would call as a compact chamber also available for uh, antenna measurements, uh, for doing radiation pattern analysis, um, uh, completely automated here as well, or automated or manual, anything of this sort can be thought about. Um, this is available from Roden Schwartz as a turnkey solution. Uh, majority of solutions available, as you can see here from Roden Schwartz, uh, especially looking at the recent requirements for meta materials, for phased array antennas, uh, for 5G uh, FR2 uh, band uh, antennas. This is also very clear. We have uh, all the antenna solutions available, uh, starting from a much larger chamber, maybe where we require to have um, uh, a chamber as big as a room or uh, quite big. There also different R&D tests can be done also in a portable solution. Also where the production requirements, we have also smaller chambers. Um, CATR or CATR uh, solutions are also available from Roden Schwartz. Uh, we also provide both the reflector array, uh, as you can see here, uh, available uh, as an ATS 800B solution. Uh, also, the compact antenna chambers with different positioners, different kinds of positioners uh, are available from Roden Schwartz with uh, a single axis or dual axis movements. Um, this is also available from Roden Schwartz, covering a very large range, as you can see here, going all the way up to 87 and 90 gigahertz here as well. So wide range of solutions available from Roden Schwartz. Um, as a summary, this is what I would conclude with. Uh, as you can see, available from Roden Schwartz are network analyzers, 
available from Rodin Schwartz are special kind of network analyzers for meta materials uh, to meet the recent uh, developments and challenges which are there in, in meta materials, especially antennas which are designed in this. Um, to measure them, it's much easier um, uh, thanks to the internal new architectures, evolved architectures in the network analyzers of today from Rodin Schwartz. Uh, internal architectures and functions for antenna tuning available for, from Rodin Schwartz, especially with an internal bias T, internal virtual transform internal functions, virtual transform uh, functions. Internal, um, time domain functions, and so on, available also by Rodin Schwartz uh, RNS uh, network analyzers. Uh, active return loss measurements. This is something which is a hot topic today uh, for multiport antennas, uh, for phase array antenna. This is also available. Uh, with an additional functionality also of uh, phase coherence. Uh, turnkey OTA measurements uh, being uh, very mandated nowadays for 5G. Um, this is also available as a turnkey solution from Rodin Schwartz, uh, including not only the network analyzer, but also the positioners and the, uh, um, uh, and the antenna uh, chambers as well, uh, available from Rodin Schwartz. So at this, I'll close my uh, topic. Maybe uh, I can, uh, I can uh, do uh, for any do questions. For any questions. Yeah, thank you, Marvin, for such a nice presentation. Now, I think we have to take the questions. Yes, sir. Yes. From the chat box. Marvin, are you, are you uh, taking the questions directly from the chat box? I will have a look. I uh, have I think a look. Uh, questions I think are also questions being answered. Are also already. being answered already. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to so see. One I'm of the trying questions. to see one of the questions. Yeah, so for measurements, yeah, so for um, measurements uh, the transmitting and receiving the antennas, antennas, both, antennas, antennas, antennas both are required. Uh, okay, you can uh, hear an okay, echo. can hear an echo. So where the transmit and receiving antennas both are required, yes, we can provide both the transmit and the receive antennas um, uh, from Rode and Schwartz. But yes, uh, the receive antenna then here in this case the antenna under test, uh, the device that is provided by you. Uh, the transmit antennas are also available from Rodin Schwartz, which are um, uh, more of a wide band, uh, especially certain Vivaldi antennas are used internally for um, measurements over a wide frequency band, um, having both um, horizontal and vertical polarizations uh, or um, horn antennas, which can also provide you uh, these kind of uh, uh, polarizations as well. Um, also, I think this question was answered. Uh, do dielectric probes uh, come with a VNA and how could we measure solid uh, dielectric materials using the network analyzer? Yes, um, uh, dielectric probes uh, can be uh, also discussed with the network analyzer as an accessory. Uh, this is really available also uh, from Rodin Schwartz. We can uh, be as a consultant for you to understand which would be this accessory uh, required because uh, the size of the solid changes, uh, the thickness changes um, for different um, solids or liquids, uh, different uh, methods of uh, uh, probes are available from Rodin Schwartz and uh, this can be implemented also. Uh, we can be provided directly also from Rodin Schwartz as a test solution. As I said, today we are moving towards uh, the requirements as a solution, and this is important for us. So yes, also BIST, the question has been answered. Uh, so BIST uh, is available um, uh, to be accessed the backside of the network analyzer, and uh, we can see these connectors on the backside, as is mentioned in the chat as well. Um, yes, this can be accessed and is available uh, typically with the uh, network analysis from Rodin, Rodin Schwartz. Uh, if not, can be also ordered as an external uh, BIST, but this becomes a little bit more 
uh, of a handling challenge. Um, so this uh, preferably being inbuilt inside the network analyzer really uh, solves a lot of these issues. Okay, how do time domain uh, while measuring antennas in the frequency domain? Um, so how to do uh, time domain gating? Uh, so yeah, um, uh, we can uh, use the time domain function which is available in network analyzer. Um, included with this is time domain gating. Uh, you can actually uh, block the network analyzer readings for a specific amount of time and say, okay, only these measurements should be transferred into the frequency domain. So we can uh, also sort of make the network analyzer blind to certain readings, uh, then put it on again during the time gate, and then put it off again in the rest of the time when the time gate is off. So these kind of things can also be done and we can really find out what is the uh, uh, frequency domain result for the antenna and the test during this time. Uh, how many elements of an array can be simultaneously created? Yes, um, uh, we have uh, network analyzers which are um, going in from a two port, yes, a four port, um, uh, and this can be further, uh, I would say, upgraded or purchased at the same time uh, at the beginning itself up to 24 ports already. Um, then there are some additional uh, port upgradations in terms of switch matrices, which can be done, uh, going well about 24 into the 100 uh, ports range as, as well uh, for massive MIMO. So usually the purchase uh, here can be done either in a phased manner, or uh, this can be done at one shot as well. Um, certain customers uh, would prefer to do uh, measurements for 16 uh, array antennas. Uh, we also are able to do this for 16, for 32, for 64 as well. Um, this is possible, yeah, yeah. So the number of ports on the network analyzer can be uh, either um, uh, initially itself uh, decided or also as an upgrade, uh, we can add these ports uh, on the network analyzer, yes. And we can, yes, uh, simultaneously excite uh, each of these ports uh, as and when required for 16 up to 24 ports as well. So I think time domain has been explained also uh, in the chat uh, by my colleagues uh, who have joined here. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is uh, time domain is typically, yes, uh, as a chirp function, you have the signal source, uh, as we were discussing internally, which is uh, used to excite the antenna, uh, basically providing a chirp signal. It's more working like an FMCW radar, right? So it is sending a chirp signal, uh, FM chirp. Uh, the resultant uh, signal is then using a chirp Z transform uh, fed back into as a time domain data. And then you can see the results on the screen. How good is the uh, reflection? How bad is the reflection? And at what time or at what distance? Um, this can be used to study the antenna, to study the feed, to study um, uh, the cable, which is coming in from the antenna, um, uh, from the uh, device under test uh, until the VNA. Uh, this can also be done. Yes, we have uh, functionalities to upgrade not only the ports, but also the frequency ranges up to about 1.1 terahertz as well. Yes, so we will share the details. Yes, so also. We, share the details um, uh, we have an um, office, yeah, we have uh, an office, office for, uh, for, office for, for uh, So you can uh, very so easily can get this also on the website uh, of uh, 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 We would also be glad to uh, share it with you, personally. Um, how good is the measurement um, in uh, engineering lab without an anechoic chamber? Yes, this is also uh, uh, one of the more uh, pertinent questions. Uh, yes, uh, it is possible to do these measurements even without an anechoic chamber. Uh, but yes, uh, we have to consider the uncertainties. Uh, it depends upon where the chamber is. Uh, for example, if we are doing certain uh, uh, open air test sites are also available. 
in certain cases uh, for the Navy, uh, this has been deployed um, uh, at the outskirts uh, from the city. It's very far away. Um, in the uh, in Western India, this is available. Uh, uh, they are using our road and sewage network analyzers. Um, and uh, but here, what happens is um, they have made sure that they are farther away uh, from population. Uh, they are not having any uh, interferences from nearby GSM base station towers and so on. Two um, G, three G towers, four G towers. Uh, this is avoided. Uh, things like this. In these conditions, yes, we can also do measurements. Um, but uh, if we are doing measurements within the lab also, um, I think as a beginner, uh, yes, it is very, very uh, good. It gives us very good results. Um, different universities have been using uh, positioners from Rodin Schwartz. Uh, they also use this uh, only as a plane positioner without an anechoic chamber as well and uh, are quite impressed with the results. Uh, they are uh, uh, within their tolerance ranges. And uh, this also is one way of doing the measurements. Um, they also phase by phase to also add an anechoic chamber at a later, later point of time. Uh, antenna arrays and MIMO, yes, uh, antenna array could be um, also uh, going into thousand uh, antennas as well or uh, much larger. Uh, MIMO also is going in that direction. Uh, two cross two MIMO was uh, well defined in uh, 3G. Uh, in 4G, this number increases, and in 5G, now this becomes massive MIMO. So, also there we have. Uh, so, uh, MIMO is an implementation, yes, of the antenna arrays. Uh, for absorber applications, also, yes, uh, if we want to use the network analyzer, it can be used uh, for studying the absorption by a, a meta material. Um, this can be done either by uh, exciting the device um, using uh, uh, antennas, uh, horn antennas, uh, also which are supplied by Roden Schwartz. Um, uh, and uh, of course, at the back end, we have the network analyzer, which will do these measurements. Um, uh, the absorber uh, will be then providing certain losses to the EM wave. Uh, if we are just simply not having any absorber in between uh, two horn antennas, um, transmit and receive, uh, we have a certain amount of loss uh, when the put in, the metamaterial structure is put in between, uh, we have a certain amount of loss. This will basically be telling us the difference between this will tell us both in magnitude and phase uh, to make it more accurate. Um, what is the loss by this uh, uh, by this structure in between? Uh, this is this is possible for us to also analyze. Uh, uh, also, maybe in certain cases, we uh, depending upon the size of the meta material, can also put it uh, in a waveguide structure to also study uh, the absorption or the shielding effectiveness of meta materials. Uh, this is possible also using the same network analyzer um, and additional waveguide uh, kits. This is possible. Uh, so, uh, also many uh, references uh, can be obtained um, uh, in uh, DIAT in uh, Pune uh, Defense uh, Institution uh, for um, uh, Engineering Studies uh, is basically also using our network analyzers with a, a full fledged uh, antenna chamber and uh, positioners from Roden Schwartz. Um, uh, it is it is possible then also uh, at many other uh, universities. Um, uh, so uh, Guwahati University and many of them are basically using uh, a full fetch a turnkey solution also available from provided by Rodin Schwartz. So this is also available as uh, different references. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Marvin. I think you have you know, taken all the questions from the chat box. Yes, sir. yes. Thanks. Yes, sir. yes. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So, Marvin, thank you very much. Marvin, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Talk. And uh, we have and, addressed uh, that. I have heard that you have started with the. Started with in the. Practicing last and about where the measurement is needed, needed over the year needed over the year so that was a wonderful that talk a and wonderful i hope talk and i hope for the students for the students and the circle and the circle member the faculty member
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you, thank Marvin. You, thanks. thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Marvin. You have started from the background and applications you have taken about the as parameters, as mid chart, active written loss, passive written loss. You have you know, gone through the passive and uh, phase data antenna testing, VNA architecture over the air testing, as well as one thing I have noticed that today our country is getting the Rafal, and you told about the testing of Rafal here also. Correct. Yeah, correct thank you yes. for correct. such a nice yes. presentation. And thank you participants for being here. Now, next session will be tomorrow morning, so please be on time. Tomorrow is the session of uh, Mr. Deepak. Okay, thank you participants and thank you, Marvin. Thank you participants, thank you, thank Marvin. You, thank you, Marvin, one second. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks for thank, the work. Thank you, sir. Thanks for thank the work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone, for the participation. Thank you, everyone, for the participation. Thank <laughs> you. 